Okay. Well, we are uh, okay. We are good to go. Um, yeah. Normally, we have uh, Zach given the given the intro. Um, he is much uh, much more uh, uh, much more. Oh wait, shoot! I'm ready to get my slides mixed up. One second. Much more organized than me. How does that sound? Okay. Here we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Well, anyways, uh, yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our bi-weekly builders call. Uh, we didn't have one last month because uh, uh, coming right off the heels of ETH Denver, there was a lot of things that folks were getting caught up on, including myself who was there. So uh, yeah, we, we went ahead and pushed it uh, to today. Um, I don't know if uh, folks remember last week, uh, or I guess uh, two, uh, uh, basically a month ago, actually, when we did do the builders call, uh, we talked about some possible tokenomics coming down uh, and what that could potentially look like. What we're researching currently with Shannon, this is where my focus is uh, a lot right now in, in trying to figure out what exactly is required to have permissionless gateways in Shannon. And today, I want to talk a bit about uh, what the uh, what Shannon could potentially look like for suppliers. So let me share my screen now. Okay. Okay. Okay, actually, one second. There we go. Okay. Okay, perfect. Sharing screen. Okay, how's that looking? Folks seeing it? I guess so. Okay, cool, cool. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the Builders Call. Uh, today, we are going to look at, uh, we're going to talk a few minutes of just a general protocol update, and then we want to get into suppliers. Uh, so, protocol-wise, uh, space has passed. This is the... Uh, the proposal that is going to allow us to increase the block size um, and also increase the amount of relays uh, required to submit a claim. So what this does is it actually reduces the amount of bloat uh, that will be on the chain while also increasing the block size so that uh, we can actually have more gateways entering the ecosystem. So we're actually talking to quite a few gateways. I was just on a meeting with uh, uh, folks this morning and it's really exciting stuff. So really excited about where the uh, where the gateway space is going with Shannon and space is gonna make that possible. So awesome job, everyone who participated in either uh, working on the research for that or getting it passed in the DAO. Uh, testnet uh, or private testnet has launched. Um, this is about, uh, the private testnet is about quick iterations. It is about breaking stuff. Uh, so because of that, it's not open uh, for everyone because that would include too many parties uh, when we need to reset something or when something uh, needs to be tested and something breaks. Uh, when you have too many moving parts, uh, it can make having quick iterations difficult. So the private testnet is about quick iterations. It's about breaking stuff and it's about establishing the basics. Uh, of what Shannon would be. Um, it already launched. We've already tested uh, some claims, uh, suppliers set, submitting claims. So it's kind of that level of thing where we're looking at the very basic parts of it, seeing how it works. And then uh, the public test net will be where the foundation is laid and people can start joining, people can start building. Uh, and people can start testing within an environment that they pretty much know is uh, is established. Um, and so we are actually going to be releasing uh, user-friendly, public-facing, user-friendly explorers. 
Uh, they're currently being deployed by uh, community members and some modifications are being made right now to them. The great thing about Shannon is it works with the Cosmos SDK because uh, it is the Cosmos SDK. So we actually have folks deploying explorers that already exist within the Cosmos uh, ecosystem and they just simply forked it and deployed it themselves. Uh, connected it to Pocket, and it started working. So that's just an awesome example of the kind of uh, uh, the kind of thing that's now going to be possible with Shannon that was not possible with Morse. We have so much more tools available to us because it's on the uh, proper Cosmos SDK. Uh, so, anyways, that's the uh, that's basically Shannon where we we're at with the uh, protocol development. Now, I want to get into a little bit of the theoretical kind of what we're what we're thinking about what like areas that i'm personally researching uh as as uh part of uh helping the protocol team and uh so today we want to focus on suppliers so before we can get an idea of what shannon will look like for suppliers i wanted to give a quick overview of what morse looks like for suppliers so in order to generate uh, average rewards, a supplier is required to run essentially 15 chains. They have to do that in three different regions, basically three different continents. Um, the monthly cost, now this obviously varies depending on the node provider. Uh, some are super efficient, some aren't as efficient. And so this is, this is all just theoretical, but you understand the fact that it, uh, it takes um, uh, it takes a lot to be a provider. So you have a hardware cost of let's say around eight thousand. Uh, your monthly rewards is going to be around eighty dollars a month, uh, and then the number of nodes that uh, you're going to have to run in order to break even is around a hundred nodes. So to do a hundred nodes, uh, you're looking at essentially a million dollars just to break even on your infrastructure, meaning you're bringing in around $8,000 uh, $8, a month to break even on your costs. Like, this is to show how off currently Shannon is. Now, providers, obviously, they're not providing a million dollars of their own income to stake it on pocket. They are able to provide, uh, you know, a lot of pocket access to their service, and then they keep a percentage of it, right? So that's why, uh, you know, 100 nodes, there's a lot of providers that are, you know, literally serving, uh, you know, over 1,000 nodes. Uh, and so then they get a small cut of that. Um, but it, it just goes to show the amount of resources that if someone knew was going to enter the space, these are the things that they would have to do in order to be successful. The reason that Morse is operating the way that it is is really because of like two main uh, two main elements that are alive in Morse. Number one is max chains. With max chains being at 15, that basically means this is how many chains you have to run to get network average. So the reason someone has to run 15 is because of this parameter. Uh, and then the reason that someone has to run nodes in three different regions is because of geomeshing. Um, now, providers, uh, some providers were doing geomeshing. Uh, I, if folks remember a few years ago, uh, certain providers just had their rewards exploding and no one knew why. And it was because they had figured out geomeshing with a private client. Um, Pocket Scan open sourced it. They, they backward engineered kind of what was going on. They open sourced it. And uh, uh, now the whole network does geomeshing. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong with geomeshing and the fact that pocket scan open sourced it was freaking phenomenal because it allowed everyone to be on the same uh playing field but the idea of geomeshing makes uh makes it so you have to run your nodes in three different regions in order to get network average so ultimately um it, it 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 created a lot more requirements on suppliers, which is what leads to the $1 million worth of uh, pocket you have to own in order to just break it even per month. So uh, what this did as a whole is it uh, you no longer have in, an independent node running community. Um, basically, most of the folks running nodes right now are providers. Um, 
and they're also the ones uh, very active in the chats talking about nodes. Uh, you don't have a lot of independent people talking about nodes uh, in, in our community anymore. That wasn't necessarily the case uh, a while ago. Um, yeah, we had a very active kind of independent community, but the economics uh, favor those in kind of the provider position. Um, it has also uh, prevented chain specialists from joining Pocket. So say someone is specialized in Solana and they run Solana nodes, they understand Solana nodes. They can't just join Pocket and get meaningful rewards or get network average rewards because they also have to run 14 other chains in three different regions. So it, it's a huge barrier to entry of someone who's potentially already specialized in an area, and they can't just monetize their knowledge in pocket without also having a huge infrastructure burden and having to specialize in 14 other nodes. Um, and so this also means that other chain, uh, other chains, their node running communities can't join pocket. Um, actually at the, uh, and this actually plays into my last point here, uh, adding new chains uh, is dependent on existing node runners. Back in the day, uh, when we were launching Avalanche, when we were launching Harmony, uh, I was part of those. Uh, I was doing business development uh, for PNI at the time, and uh, one of the exciting things is those communities were joining Pocket because they're like, "Oh, cool! Like I can run, you know, a node for Avalanche, which I'm passionate about Avalanche." Uh, and now I can monetize it. Uh, and then people that were already running Avalanche nodes were then buying pocket nodes to monetize it further. And so it created a great synergy uh, between our ecosystems. That's kind of fallen apart now because uh, of the complexity of joining uh, the pocket network. Uh, so what this opens up, or, or so, uh, uh, so that's something that we want to address. Um, and we want uh, we want Pocket to ultimately be able to tap into other node running communities, especially when we're adding a new chain. Adding a new chain, why not get all their node runners uh, onto Pocket, and then they can be the ones to run the initial infrastructure for their chain. Versus right now, Grove has to pay someone to run infrastructure. Uh, they have to pay a provider to run infrastructure uh, for them to kind of bootstrap and get initial nodes on the protocol. Uh, so that's that's the state of where Morse uh, is today. Now, what we want to do with Shannon is obviously we want to open this up. We want to make it so anyone can generate network average uh, with Shannon. So in this case, uh, we're looking at the number uh, the number of chains uh, could be potentially one here. Um, and the reason is is we uh, either won't even have a max chains parameter or it'll, uh, just be set to something like one. Um, but just simply having that parameter, uh, uh, having that parameter act differently in Shannon suddenly reduces the need to run so many chains. Um, also, uh, we're looking into uh, essentially doing regions where you can't uh, you can't geo mesh. Uh, geo meshing would be impossible. This would allow anyone who's running a node at their own home, a node, uh, professionally somewhere, uh, they don't have to be in three regions, just one region, wherever they're at, they could start monetizing their infrastructure. Because if you have to think about joining Pocket, you then have to think about, okay, well, I need to run my infrastructure in a completely different way in different regions. That's going to bar 90% of people from even wanting to consider Pocket. If Pocket's uh, value proposition is if you're already running a data source, already running something like a, a blockchain node, Wherever you're at, you can monetize it. That's huge value proposition. Uh, and so the the hardware costs could be anywhere from you know zero to maybe two hundred bucks. Uh, zero if you're already running it uh, for your own business, running it on your own, what have you. You can just monetize it on top of your existing business. Uh, you can generate you know eight dollars a month if it, if we're uh, talking about the network average. Um, and, uh, you know, you to break even, you know, you maybe need one, two, maybe three nodes. Now, that all just depends on what your hardware cost is. But ultimately, you're looking at a significant lower buy-in. And this is also staked Pocket. So, uh, you know, most of the people that are joining Pocket want to hold Pocket so that they can uh, receive the upside of the network growing. So uh, the advantages here is any node runner can join Pocket. You just need one Pocket node and one chain node to essentially generate network average. 
This allows specialists uh, to generate revenue by running pocket nodes alongside the blockchain nodes they already run. Um, pocket can also be used for any data source. Uh, this is especially important when we're thinking outside of just blockchain RPC. What about LLMs? What about different types of indexing or custom APIs? Like there's all sorts of things, you know, Pocket is ultimately a general data protocol. Any data type can go through Pocket. It doesn't have to be a blockchain node. It can be anything, which is why we've talked a lot about LLMs in the forums. And that's a very heavy topic uh, because Pocket Protocol fits in perfectly with simply being able to connect people who want data to that data source and create an economic incentive for them. Uh, uh, and so once you start getting into new data sources, you don't want an LLM to also have to run 14 other blockchains to receive network average. You know, like you, you want to be able to just a, speciali a specialist in one area on a Dizer node. Um, and then providers in Pocket then become a feature, not a requirement. Uh, providers still, you know, serve the markets uh, with people who don't want to run nodes at all. They want to completely abstract away the need to run a node. That's awesome. That's exactly where providers come, uh, come into place. But it doesn't make Pocket required, uh, or it doesn't make providers required for the Pocket ecosystem to operate. Um, and uh, you can also have providers launch in very specific areas, like you know, uh, you know, chains. Like you could have providers that specialize in only one or two chains. And if you want to generate rewards from those chains, you go to uh, you go to them. Uh, or if uh, uh, they specialize in something like LLMs, once we get new data sources, a lot of possibilities there. So uh, I want to quickly then talk about what. Uh, what the reward, uh, a new kind of how we're looking at rewards, or at least how I'm looking at rewards uh, within Shannon, and kind of give you an understanding of where my mind's at. And right now within Morse, you have a breakdown of suppliers get 85% of the reward, uh, the DAO gets 10%, and validators get 5%. Uh, a new theory that, uh, and a model that I'm building out right now and thinking through is. Have I, uh, oh no. You're back, you Shane. Like we, we, yeah, we lost you for a minute, but um, you're back. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I was just continuing Go the slide. 60. Go back 60 seconds. I think that was 60 help. seconds. Okay, so yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you can see the rewards more break, uh, of the Morse reward breakdown, suppliers, dial validators. Uh, Shannon, I'm working on a new model that has some new concepts in it, uh, which is sources, where uh, sources actually get part of the revenue. So what is a source? A source can be uh, the client uh, that, a, uh, sub, uh, that a service ID is connected to. So say, okay, so right now we have uh, Polygon is the highest uh, generating chain on Pocket today, right? Uh, the only people that receive rewards are the suppliers. However, Polygon, the Polygon Foundation is maintaining their own uh, their own nodes. They're they're creating uh, uh, they're improving on their nodes. They're uh, they're working on the clients themselves, and yet they don't have any incentive to be on Pocket. Uh, the reason Polygon's on Pocket is simply because uh, you know gateways needed access to it. Uh, but the foundation itself, like the Polygon Foundation, the Polygon team doesn't actually have any connection to Pocket. But what if we actually allowed those chains or really any data source that comes to Pocket the ability to also monetize and generate revenue from the traffic that's using their data source, right? Now, it's still being hosted by suppliers, right? Suppliers are still hosting the Polygon nodes. But... Uh, but there's real resources going into building those data sources. Now, in the case of Polygon, they're obviously a large chain. 
Uh, but what if uh, it's new indexing technology? Uh, I've actually, I'll, I'll go ahead and move on to the next slide to kind of explain where all the incentives are with this. But um, uh, with basically the idea is to allow those that are building data clients or building sources, whatever you want to call it, uh, they can generate revenue from pocket. So this includes new chain foundations, as I mentioned. This could also be LLMs. Say someone comes up with a uh, specific LLM and trains it in a specific manner that uh, is able to provide uh, really great uh, responses to a particular area, say like IT or uh, networking or something of that nature. Um, and they're incentivized to actually bring it to pocket because then if more users access their LLM model, they actually can generate revenue from this. Um, and this applies this this applies to far more beyond just blockchains, as I mentioned, LLMs. This could mention indexers. Actually, back in 2021, uh, I was talking to the team about this kind of concept because uh, at the time I was talking with uh, an indexer. And they had some really cool technology, and I was trying to convince them to, hey, let's bring it to pocket. But they were like, why? I like why? Why does it matter if 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 our technology is on pocket or not? Um, and I didn't really have an answer for them. And then that's where I talked to the team, and I was just like, hey, we need to have a cut for uh, for sources because he should be incentivized to want to bring his technology to pocket because if it grows on pocket, he generates revenue. Um, and so that's really where it kind of this idea was originally seeded, um, because we want to incentivize people to come to pocket with their data source. Um, right now, if someone were to come to pocket, because like right now, if uh, that indexer would come to pocket, they would have to come to pocket and then they would have to run it themselves, all the infrastructure themselves uh, for serving it. Or they'd have to run a gateway and, uh, you know, have this user facing gateway for uh, developers to interact with. And they just didn't want any of that. That's not why they're building their indexing. They're not building their indexing to then have all these other responsibilities required to have it monetized. So if Pocket is already creating a way for suppliers to uh, generate revenue off of data sources, uh, it makes sense that the data sources as well get to uh, generate some revenue there too. Um, so uh, I did some just kind of like napkin math, um, but, the, but, but if uh, we look at Pocket and possibly around 20 billion relays in just kind of my napkin math calculations, I believe we could become deflationary. Uh, and then at that point, you know, just to kind of give a reference of like some of what it could look like, you know, the Polygon Foundation could be generating $20,000 uh, a month simply for being on pocket. Um, that's just a huge incentive to to want a partner because this is something where they're just doing you know, they don't have to do anything else other than continue what they're doing. And their incentives are already to, you know, build the best polygon they can. We're not their incentive, but what a, what a great relationship that creates. Uh, and then this also think of other, you know, an exchange like Binance, they could be generating a uh, decent enough uh, return just from being Binance and being a partner with us. So we want to create that uh, ability for for foundations or data sources, anyone to come partner with us, join Pocket. And if it takes off, if users start using your data source and suppliers are running it, you get part of the uh, you get part of the reward as well. Because they're also the ones adding value to Pocket um, by creating a data source that suppliers want to run and users want to access. So anywho, that's uh yeah. That's basically kind of the uh, the gist of it, of what I wanted to kind of give a deep dive about and open, just wanted to open up the floor then. If people have thoughts, questions, all this is kind of bleeding edge, what I'm currently kind of like working on, uh, what I'm kind of uh, figuring out on the tokenomics side and things of that nature. So happy to start getting feedback from folks or uh, get people's thoughts. This, uh, this also is an open time, so if folks want to uh, talk about other things as well, this is a builder's call. My goal is to start giving folks a uh, perception 
of what Shannon could look like, be like, and especially for the builders in our ecosystem, that's just really important to see where things are coming and uh, where the protocol uh, is potentially going, uh, just so people can know how to run their businesses and things of that nature. All right. Um, service slash, okay, so this is from Ramiro, uh, service slash chains whitelisting will be permission then. Um, it, it doesn't, no, it doesn't necessarily have to be permissioned um, on the adding a new chain. Um, what would likely happen is it would require a direct partnership with PNF to receive those rewards. So to receive the source rewards, you would have to partner with uh, PNF. Um, we couldn't allow that to just be permissionless because uh, there could be potential gaming. Um, you could also potentially have people uh, you know, getting the source rewards when they're not actually the one building the source. So an example of this was if, um, you know, someone were to start a uh, Ethereum, uh, you know, someone were to somehow claim, because it's permissionless, the Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum service ID when, you know, they're not actually the Ethereum foundation or they're not the builders building the clients. Uh, we can't have something like that happen. So there has to be a little bit of vetting. All this is still early, but this would be something where it'd be more of a uh, permission thing with uh, likely with PNF. Um, I'm sure there's a way to do it permissionlessly in the future, uh, but at least for now, this would, you know, be permission through PNF from at least my initial uh, my initial thinking of it, um, just so we could potentially have this at launch without having too many technical hurdles. Um, make it permissioned with PNF. Also. So a great opportunity to create partnerships between Pocket officially and these other either data sources or chain foundations. Uh, if suppliers get some of the rewards, couldn't that uh, couldn't that add to downward selling pressure on the token in the form of people taking profits, not paying for infra? Uh, I sorry, I'm a little. I'm not fully understanding. If suppliers get some of the rewards, they already get rewards. I, I, do you mean sources? I, I guess you mean sources. If source. I thought you're stopping. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that, that's something that we can control. I, I don't, I, I've never seen a blockchain being able to properly control, like have an open market and then also be able to control who sells when and, and how, um, unless it's, you know, some kind of mechanism built into the protocol or something. But uh, I don't really think that's a, a concern because if, uh, you know, if someone like Polygon is is selling their tokens, that's perfectly fine. Like that's perfectly fine. That that means that they're getting value out of the pocket network. We want to encourage that. Um, and then that means that creates a better partnership with them. That would uh, potentially then signal to other data sources, hey, if I come to Pocket and if uh, users start using my data sources, hey, I start getting a reward. So even though they're selling their pocket it's potentially creating uh, that's actually plays well into this narrative because then it incentivizes people to come to pocket to monetize their sources. Uh, okay, another comment, super interesting way to grow the network uh, with more independent node runners. How is QoS affected or maintained? That's actually a great question. Um, there, there has been a narrative that uh, I've seen kind of around where uh it like you have to be a a provider a big provider in order to provide good quality of service um that's actually a misconception um and actually historically so that's inaccurate so if you actually look at growth um again i've worked for pni uh many times in the past uh i've been a part of the ecosystem for a long time and so grove slash previously pni uh they when they run into quality of service issues, it's not because of an independent node runner. It's always been because a large node runner that has so much of the network uh, under their control has an issue with a node or has an issue with a chain. 
It's never been from the small guys because a gateway themselves can already pick and choose which nodes they want to uh, send to. So when we had a lot of independent node runners, they actually had a lot of diversity with who they could uh, send relays to. Now, sure, some of them might not be uh, uh, doing it, or some of them might not be good node runners at all. Um, but many of them, like for example, many of them were using NodePilot, and NodePilot was creating no issue for uh, Grove or PNI. Like th there was, there was no issues being created from people running NodePilot because they were running good, solid blockchain nodes through NodePilot, and their rewards were just as much as everyone else in terms of network average. Um, so, uh, so Grove was selecting them to send relays to. Uh, so, anyways. That that that's a bit of a misconception. Um, now, with other data sources coming online and all this stuff, uh, you actually don't want providers that hold huge uh, huge amounts of the market under their control um, in the future, because that is what will create quality of service issues. The more diverse we have uh, in terms of more uh, more uh, data servicers. That's fantastic. That that adds so much to the protocol that then gateways can utilize. All right. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? We can we can also talk about anything beyond this as well. I'd just like to say it was a great presentation, Shane. I really enjoyed it. It's extremely informative. I'm not really a tech guy, you know. Peter, myself, and uh, Dan, who are in this call, are all business partners at Co Unity. Uh, we're looking to really. Uh, accelerate community growth uh, and align a strategy that is uh, you know aligned with uh, the launch of Shannon. So this has just been great. Uh, really enjoy listening to you. Really enjoyed your presentation and really enjoy how you're answering these questions. So thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. More of those comments are uh, encouraged as well. <laughs> All right. We'll give folks a few more moments. So I'll, I'll go ahead and just do a quick uh, uh, Zach's normally here, and he normally uh, tackles some of the uh, some of the other announcements. Um, but uh, just a reminder, folks that are doing quick rants, um, yeah, the end of the month is coming up, and so on uh, Arma, uh, you can submit updates. So just be sure to submit updates to your uh, to your quick rants, and then um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of. If there's any other specific updates that is relevant to to builders, um, I don't I don't think so. Um, and regarding uh, regarding testnet, uh, if if folks uh, if any folks are are wanting to you know participate in testnet or keep, um, especially once we get closer to the uh, to the public testnet. Feel free to reach out to me. I'm kind of uh, a uh, uh, I'm kind of a funnel of helping uh, helping the protocol team connect with the right folks that can help with uh, help with different parts of the at least private testnet to begin with, and then uh, help get folks onboarded once we hit the public testnet. So, if anyone has any yeah anything they want to connect with uh, uh, connect with me on, feel free to just reach out. Um, the uh, I'm, I'm just working closely with the protocol team to make sure they're not being pulled in too many directions and they're able to kind of continue focusing on the protocol, but I'm definitely open to, to having folks reach out to let them, let me know uh, what they would like to bring to the table or what they, uh, 
uh, or how they want to be involved uh, either uh, now or in the future. And, and I can communicate when that would, uh, when that time would come, but feel free to reach out though. Hey Shane. So if someone has questions, ideas, or a feedback on tokenomics in the future, uh, is there a forum to post that? Or are you thinking like DM you, post that in Discord, put it on the forum, um, or are we still kind of working that through? Yeah, no, good, good question. Uh, so I'm actually going to be uh, off in uh, two weeks uh, getting married. So going to be taking a little time off. Uh, and so because of that, I'm going to be uh, releasing kind of an initial tokenomics, uh, no, I, I like an initial paper on both tokenomics and the migration uh, from going Shannon to Morris. Kind of like how I'm doing here. I'm trying oh, to let sure. people know what Shannon looks like. Yeah, versus Shannon, what, uh, what Shannon looks like versus... Oh, we, we got a... Here, I'm going to server mute. Um, uh, sorry, I was hearing myself. We, uh, uh, I, I kind of like how I'm doing here, trying to help people get an understanding of what Morse is versus what Shannon is. That's what I'm trying to release in the next uh, two weeks um, before there will be a little time off. So, yeah, good, good question. That's basically in the pipeline for the next two weeks. Kind of today and tomorrow is is my heads down day. See how far I can get. Um, but next week, for sure, there's going to be something released on the forum. Uh, people could start to look at. The idea is to start conversations around these things. Um, I'm giving everyone kind of an early look of these of these things, so people could start munching on them now. But once it hits the open forum, that's where it's, yeah, going to be great to get people's feedback, because that's how we're going to really uh, sharpen what Shannon uh, can be on the tokenomic side and make sure we're not missing anything, make sure we're, you know, ultimately building the best uh, protocol we possibly can. Thanks for all the congrats. How will your wedding affect the tokenomics of Shannon? That uh, I will be posting that on the forum as well. <laughs> this, I think that's an important one. Uh, uh, I don't know how you know, expensive or ch cheap weddings are these days. Well, I mean, I was thinking it would be good to add just one more on here, uh, and there could be the wedding fund. So, uh, you know, just one percent or something. You know, something small. I I, I don't want to be greedy or anything. We'll take that to the dam. <laughs> Take it to the death. <laughs> oh. All right, folks. Last uh, last chance. All right. Well, I definitely appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, yeah, and sorry if. Uh, so folks saw my ping before uh i i thought that this meeting was actually starting uh an hour earlier so <laughs> anyways uh but I, I got all my calendar invites updated now so should be good in the future um but anyways thanks for uh yeah thanks for joining everyone and uh i guess we'll see you in uh, actually to be fair in two weeks um i'm not gonna be here so i guess to be determined if we're actually gonna have a uh yeah to be determined uh, on the next uh on the next builders call so cool cool all right take it easy guys thanks shane thanks shane